Chapter 13 It was all very well to join them, but speaking to them proved quite as much as ever an effort beyond my strength, offered in close quarters difficulties as insurmountable as before. This situation continued a month, and with new aggravations and particular notes, the note, above all, sharper and sharper, of the small ironic consciousness on the part of my pupils. It was not, I am as sure today as I was then, my mere infernal imagination. It was absolutely traceable that they were aware of my predicament, and that this strange relation made, in a manner, for a long time, the air in which we moved. I don't mean that they had their tongues in their cheeks or did anything vulgar, for that was not one of their dangers. I do mean, on the other hand, that the element of the unnamed and untouched became, between us, greater than any other, and that so much avoidance could not have been so successfully effected without a great deal of tacit arrangement. It was as if, at moments, we were perpetually coming into sight of subjects before which we must stop short, turning suddenly out of alleys that we perceived to be blind, closing with a little bang that made us look at each other, for, like all bangs, it was something louder than we had intended, the doors we had indiscreetly opened. All roads lead to Rome, and there were times when it might have struck us that almost every branch of study or subject of conversation skirted forbidden ground. Forbidden ground was the question of the return of the dead in general, and of whatever in especial might survive in memory of the friends little children had lost. There were days when I could have sworn that one of them had, with a small invisible nudge, said to the other, She thinks she'll do it this time, but she won't. To do it would have been to indulge, for instance, and for once in a way, in some direct reference to the lady who had prepared them for my discipline. They had a delightful endless appetite for passages in my own history, to which I had again and again treated them. They were in possession of everything that had ever happened to me, had had, with every circumstance, a story of my smallest adventures, and of those of my brothers and sisters, and of the cat and the dog at home, as well as many particulars of the eccentric nature of my father, of the furniture and arrangement of our house and of the conversation of the old women of our village. There were things enough, taking one with another, to chatter about, if one went very fast and knew by instinct when to go round. They pulled with an art of their own the strings of my invention and my memory, and nothing else perhaps, when I thought of such occasions afterward, gave me so the suspicion of being watched from under cover. It was in any case over my life, my past, and my friends alone, that we could take anything like our ease, a state of affairs that led them sometimes without the least pertinence to break out into sociable reminders. I was invited, with no visible connection, to repeat afresh Goody Gosling's celebrated sayings, or to confirm the details already supplied as to the cleverness of the vicarage pony. It was partly at such junctures as these, and partly at quite different ones, that with the turn my matters had now taken, my predicament, as I have called it, grew most sensible. The fact that the days passed for me without another encounter ought, it would have appeared, to have done something towards soothing my nerves since the light brush that second night on the upper landing of the presence of a woman at the foot of the stair, I had seen nothing, whether in or out of the house, that one had better not have seen. There was many a corner round which I expected to come upon Quint, and many a situation that, in a merely sinister way, would have favoured the appearance of Miss Jessel. The summer had turned, the summer had gone, the autumn had dropped upon Bly, and had blown out half our lights. 
the place with its grey sky and withered garlands, its bared spaces and scattered dead leaves, was like a theatre after the performance, all strewn with crumpled playbills. There were exactly states of the air, conditions of sound and of stillness, unspeakable impressions of the kind of ministering moment that brought back to me long enough to catch it the feeling of the medium in which, that June evening out of doors, I had had my first sight of Quint, and in which, too, at those other instants, I had, after seeing him through the window, looked for him in vain in the circle of shrubbery. I recognised the signs, the portents, I recognised the moment, the spot, but they remained unaccompanied and empty, and I continued unmolested. If unmolested one could call a young woman, whose sensibility had, in the most extraordinary fashion, not declined, but deepened. I had said in my talk with Mrs. Gross on that horrid scene of Flora's by the lake, and had perplexed her by so saying, that it would from that moment distress me much more to lose my power than to keep it. I had then expressed what was vividly in my mind, the truth that, whether the children really saw or not, since, that is, it was not yet definitely proved, I greatly preferred, as a safeguard, the fullness of my own exposure. I was ready to know the very worst that was to be known, what I had then had an ugly glimpse of was that my eyes might be sealed just while theirs were most opened. Well, my eyes were sealed, it appeared, at present, a consummation for which it seemed blasphemous not to thank God. There was, alas, a difficulty about that. I would have thanked him with all my soul had I not had, in a proportionate measure, this conviction of the secret of my pupils. How can I retrace today the strange steps of my obsession? There were times of our being together when I would have been ready to swear that literally, in my presence, but with my direct sense of it closed, they had visitors who were known and were welcome. Then it was that, had I not been deterred by the very chance that such an injury might prove greater than the injury to be averted, my exultation would have broken out. They're here, they're here, you little wretches, I would have cried, and you can't deny it now. The little wretches denied it with all the added volume of their sociability and their tenderness, in just the crystal depths of which, like the flash of a fish in a stream, the mockery of their advantage peeped up. The shock, in truth, had sunk into me still deeper than I knew, on the night when, looking out to see either Quint or Miss Jessel under the stars, I had beheld the boy over whose rest I watched, and who had immediately brought in with him, had straightway there turned it on me, the lovely upward look with which, from the battlements above me, the hideous apparition of Quint had played. If it was a question of a scare, my discovery on this occasion had scared me more than any other, and it was in the condition of nerves produced by it that I made my actual inductions. They harassed me so that sometimes, at odd moments, I shut myself up audibly to rehearse. It was at once a fantastic relief and a renewed despair, the manner in which I might come to the point. I approached it from one side, and the other, while, in my room, I flung myself about, but I always broke down in the monstrous utterance of names. As they died away on my lips, I said to myself that I should indeed help them to represent something infamous, if, by pronouncing them, I should violate as rare a little case of instinctive delicacy as any schoolroom probably had ever known. When I said to myself, they have the manners to be silent, and you, trusted as you are, the baseness to speak, I felt myself crimson, and I covered my face with my hands. After these secret scenes, I chattered more than ever, 
going on volubly enough till one of our prodigious palpable hushes occurred. I can call them nothing else, the strange dizzy lift or swim, I try for terms, into a stillness, a pause of all life, that had nothing to do with the more or less noise that at the moment we might be engaged in making, and that I could hear through my deepened exhilaration or quickened recitation or louder strum of the piano. Then it was that the others, the outsiders, were there. Though they were not angels, they passed, as the French say, causing me, while they stayed, to tremble with the fear of their addressing to their younger victims some yet more infernal message or more vivid image than they had thought good enough for myself. What it was most impossible to get rid of was the cruel idea that, whatever I had seen, Miles and Flora saw more, things terrible and unguessable, and that sprang from dreadful passages of intercourse in the past, such things naturally left on the surface, for the time, a chill which we vociferously denied that we felt, and we had, all three, with repetition, got into such splendid training that we went each time, almost automatically, to mark the close of the incident through the very same movements. It was striking of the children, at all events, to kiss me, inveterately, with a kind of wild irrelevance, and never to fail, one or the other, of the precious question that had helped us through many a peril. When do you think he will come? Don't you think we ought to write? There was nothing like that inquiry. We found by experience for carrying off an awkwardness. He, of course, was their uncle in Harley Street, and we lived in much profusion of theory that he might at any moment arrive to mingle in our circle. It was impossible to have given less encouragement than he had done to such a doctrine, but if we had not had the doctrine to fall back upon, we should have deprived each other of some of our finest exhibitions. He never wrote to them. That may have been selfish, but it was a part of the flattery of his trust of me, for the way in which a man pays his highest tribute to a woman is apt to be but by the more festal celebration of one of the sacred laws of his comfort, and I held that I carried out the spirit of the pledge, given not to appeal to him, when I let my charges understand that their own letters were but charming literary exercises. They were too beautiful to be posted. I kept them myself. I have them all to this hour. This was a rule, indeed, which only added to the satiric effect of my being plied with the supposition that he might at any moment be among us. It was exactly as if my charges knew how almost more awkward than anything else that might be for me. There appears to me, moreover, as I look back, no note in all this more extraordinary than the mere fact that, in spite of my tension and of their triumph, I never lost patience with them. Adorable they must in truth have been, I now reflect, that I didn't, in these days, hate them. Would exasperation, however, if relief had longer been postponed, finally have betrayed me? It little matters for relief arrived. I call it relief, though it was only the relief that a snap brings to a strain or the burst of a thunderstorm to a day of suffocation. It was at least change, and it came with a rush. End of chapter 13